Griff Aldrich, welcome to Sports Spectrum, sir. How you doing? Doing very well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's great to talk to you. Uh, you've got quite the story, Griff Aldrich. Mm -hmm. You really do. But let's start with the more recent uh, success, we'll say, the 2021-2022 season and the Longwood Lancers making their first ever NCAA tournament appearance. Describe what that was like, winning the conference tournament, and you know you're going to be a part of March Madness and, and then just participating in it. What was that like for you? You know, it, it was really, um, I mean, surreal. Surreal is the only um, way to describe it. Um, there's still so many days where, um, and it's becoming less and less, but there's still so many days that I'm shocked. Number one, I'm in college basketball and right. that I'm in, you know, I was a division three guy. So I'm shocked that I'm at division one and I'm shocked that I'm a head coach. And, um, and so, you know, winning the championship and then realizing, you know, you're going to be in March Madness was just, uh, um, you know, just an unbelievable blessing. And um, you know, we can we can talk further about this. I, I got asked, uh, uh, you know, sometimes about um, did making March Madness validate, you know, the decision to get into coaching. Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely not. You know, my my decision to get into coaching was, I felt like I was calling, I was following what God was calling me to do. And so if anything, and I think this was true, this whole year has been remarkable. I just felt like God's hand was just blessing us. And it was a really neat experience to kind of be, to see it and just be like, wow, this is just an incredible blessing, you know, from God. When I looked at sort of Longwood's history here of of basketball over the past 20 years, I don't think you guys had even finished over 500 from what I was looking at. So this was the first time in 21 years that you even had a record in over 500 and you shattered that obviously 26 wins, seven losses. What made this year so special for you as a coach and for your players? You know, I, I think this is, you know, this is my fourth year. Um, and we, it was a really neat blend of, returners and newcomers. Um, and I really do think we've got an incredible uh, collection of, of fine young men. And um, I think they've really bought into what, what we're trying to be as a, as a program, uh, which is, you know, obviously a, a championship level basketball program, but at the same time, a program where we're really trying to grow and develop as men. Uh, myself included. And, um, you know, and, and I think the guys have really, we talk about pouring into the root a lot, obviously you reap what you sow. Mm. Um, but we, we talk about pouring into the root all the time and, and um, controlling what you can control. And, and uh, it's not atypical for me to talk about my failures uh, with the guys. And so um, I think to kind of move along uh, this season with the guys and see the growth and them embracing. And, and one of the fun things is you start to hear them repeat, you know, what the program sayings are. And, uh, and so that's a lot of fun. What's the great lesson that the Lord taught you this season when you look back? Obviously, he teaches us something new. And I may even ask you this question again uh, in a little bit in terms of what he's teaching you now. But what was the lesson when you think back to this whole season and this experience and this journey that you just went on? What do you think the, the great lesson is that God was teaching you in, in that season? That's a great question. Um, I think I was really, I think I really grew in trust with him this year. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a type A achievement guy. And throughout my life, I have continued to be somebody who, okay, you achieve one thing. And sometimes when you have success, um, you, you even hold tighter so that you don't lose that success. And, you know, my bet is with athletes, it's, you know, you start to become a, a star Well, you don't want to go back to being just a, a solid player. And so you can actually hold on tighter to it. And I, I 
think I felt like God was really showing me this year to just let go that number one, he's going to do what he's going to do. And I got a verse, um, you ought to do a, a, if you don't know Casey Crawford, uh, I think we may have talked about him. You ought to have him on. Uh, he runs Movement Mortgage in Charlotte, North Carolina. An incredible, incredible story of, uh, of uh, faith in the marketplace. Uh, but he was a tight end at, at Virginia and then the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, yeah. But anyhow, um, one of the verses that they really use and speak to is Isaiah 26, 12. Um, and I kind of grabbed hold of that. And, um, you know, the, the verse is the Lord establishes peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. And I really liked it because it was given to me, you know, towards uh, a couple of weeks before our conference tournament. Um, and, you know, it says, you know, we have accomplished things like we did do the work like we we didn't just wait for God to drop manna onto our basketball court. We practiced the guys worked, we prepared, but you have done for us. And so it I really liked how it 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 kind of established, you know, hey, we're going to do the work. But at the end of the day, Lord, you're going to you're going to provide and whatever you provide is going to be sufficient. And so, um, um, now maybe that's easier to do when you, you, you're having the season that we had and, and, uh, but, um, but, but I do feel like, you know, we really grew in trust. Griff Aldrich is our guest here on sports spectrum, Longwood meds basketball coach. So we saw what happened this past year, but there's a amazing story behind all of what culminated in this opportunity to be a part of March madness and to make the NCAA tournament because even coaching wasn't something that you kind of went through and did the the coaching journey that a lot of guys do. It's a completely different journey. So let's let's tell us, let's share more about your story, I guess, particularly the role that Christ plays in your life as well. So tell me about maybe your walk with Christ and when that began and kind of took shape for you. You know, I, I grew up in a uh, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, my parents were had a weird, uh, kind of marital situation that they were, they were separated for about eight or nine years before they got divorced. Hmm. Uh, but my mother was, a uh, is a devout, um, Christian. Um, the faith was a, a huge part of, of our upbringing. Um, but I also went to a high powered prep school, um, where, um, status and achievement were really gods and promoted. Um, and so for me, even though faith, I, I had a real faith, um, status and achievement, um, and, you know, coming from a chaotic home life, uh, in a broken home, um, trying to find identity and, and approval, um, in accomplishments really became my God. And uh, that transpired. I went to Hampton Sydney College uh, to play Division Three basketball, um, and um, but even there, my focus was Hampton Sydney is a good school, but I need to go to a great. I need to go to a great grad school. So my God became, hey, I'm going to really excel academically. Um, and but I loved basketball. Basketball was I played. It was a passion. Um, grew up in Virginia Beach, where in ACC country, and and uh, spent my Saturdays and Sundays watching uh, Jefferson or Acom and and the those games. Yeah. Um, but after I left um, uh, Hampton Sydney, I actually had an opportunity to to go be a graduate assistant um, with Dave Odom at Wake Forest at the time, my best friend from, from college and my best friend in coaching now is Ryan Odom, his son, uh, Ryan's at Utah State. Um, but uh, Coach Odom found out that I was, I had also applied to law school. And, um, and so I loved basketball and I wanted to coach but I also had this other thing where, hey, I needed to go uh, prove myself in, in academically. 
and he told me I had to go uh, go to law school, that he was revoking my uh, my offer to come to Wake. So I did that. Uh, and even during law school, uh, I coached um, and uh, coached at the Covenant School in Charlotte, Charlottesville uh, for two years. And um, was it kind of a so side ultimately- gig coach, kind of a side gig, if you will? coaching yeah i was just in i was a jv coach um and uh, going to law school uh my second and third year of law school and and uh um and you know my faith really in law school you know college i was a i was a knucklehead um and um but my faith really became more prominent in law school and i kind of uh um my real story was I had gotten into Virginia law school and I knew I was going to go there. Um, and I still remember feeling really empty, um, one night at a fraternity party. And, uh, Mm. it's like, man, this is, this is not that neat. And uh, that's where I started to move back to, to Christ. And I think in law school, I became, uh, much more, uh, firm in my faith. Um, but my journey was a lot of like, I still wanted to go to the parties and, uh, but I wanted to go, uh, to church on, so God had a hand on, on me, but I was still tugging. And, um, after law school, I went to, um, I went back to Hampton, Sydney to coach. And this is where my faith really, um, came into being. We had an incredible year. Uh, we were 26 and two at Hampton, Sydney, um, but I was an ambitious guy. And, um, and during that year, um, I was out Hampton Sydney's out in the country and my best friend was a, uh, a local pastor, uh, at a small Baptist church and we would meet for breakfast and he would disciple me. Um, and I think God was kind of taking me to the country, uh, Hampton Sydney's an all male school. So, uh, the distraction of young ladies, uh, was not, was not relevant for me. Um, and I think God was taking me a little bit into the wilderness that year. And during that year, um, I became committed to my faith at that point. Um, and I was like, this is who I want to be. Um, but that ambition was still there and my identity was still, um, about performance and, um, At the end of the year, um, we had had a great year um, and uh, felt really, got a lot of affirmation. Hey, I think you could be good at this. Um, But I had an incredible amount of fear that I would not rise in the coaching profession. And it was at the core of who I was that I have to succeed and and do something with my life in the world's eyes, do something. Mm -hmm. And so I left coaching and I wasn't mature enough at that point, uh, to, to say, Hey, you know, God is everything. And if he's called me to this, um, then to do that. And so I went to Houston, Texas and, um, you know, to, to practice law at a large law firm. So, um, that's a little bit of, of my faith journey. I can keep going or, or, um, um, I don't know how you want to, how you want to do this. Well, there's a lot, right. Yeah. Cause there's more, there's more pivots and turns and, yeah. and, and chapters to the, to the book. And there, I'm sure there'll be more chapters to the, to the story of Griff Aldrich. Let me ask you about, cause while you were practicing law and you have this, this, uh, coaching, you know, itch that you still want to scratch. I read that you started a Christ-centered AAU team. Uh, so you're still getting involved and even bringing faith into that when you're doing something like this AAU team, but not going all the way in. You're still a lawyer, right? Tell us like how you were navigating those two worlds. So, you know, I got to Houston. I knew basketball is just such a big part of who I was, even still. And, um, I felt really called to um, coach AAU and um, uh, but I was really called to coach in the inner city of, you know, uh, of Houston, uh, third ward, which is one of the the most under-resourced areas of the of the city. 
Hmm. Um, and the goal really was, was more to provide, um, you know, a stable experience for the guys and teach them faith and, and life lessons, but using the hook of basketball. And, um, and so that was, that was an incredible joy. And so, um, you know, it was a challenge. I would usually practice. Uh, uh, we would practice Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is when I first got there um, around 7.30 to 9.30. And then you would drive all the kids home. Um, and sometimes I'd have to go back to the office. And, and uh, you know, as a lawyer, uh, at that point in my career, um, you know, usually you get marching orders around five or six at night, and then you got to finish work and then get it to them before the night's over. So I could come back to the office and, and do it. But, you know, is that point that I really started to realize, you know, I, I, I do, um, you know, this is a little bit different than just a passion. Like I really enjoy it. Um, but, you know, life took a, a weird turn, um, in that, uh, um, in, I think it was 2005. So I've been practicing for five years. Uh, Tony Shaver, my, my, uh, college coach was at William and Mary and he offered, or he was about to offer me a position to come join him at William and Mary. Mm -hmm. And two days before, and I said, I'm all in. And now my wife, I told her we were dating at the time, hey, I may take this job. It's $18,000 a year. I don't know how this is going to work. And, and, but I, I'm going to do it. And, uh, and as she likes to say, I, I said, hey, will you come to Williamsburg with me? And she said, yeah, if I have a ring. <laughs> and so uh, very wise. Yes. Um, but two days before he was going to offer the job and the job was going to close from state regulation, you know, and they could make the offer. Uh, Joe Wolf, the former NBA player in North Carolina Tar Heel sure. called and said, uh, Hey, I want to get into coaching and Tony Shaver played for Dean Smith. And so uh, I got the call from coach Shaver and I said, coach, if, if I were Tony Shaver, I would be hiring Joe Wolf. Like this is an easy decision, but I really felt at that point in my life, I said, okay, God, you like, this is a, that, that was a God thing. Like, and so I felt very comfortable that, Hey, okay, maybe basketball is closed and that's okay. And about a year later, uh, we got the opportunity to move to London with my law firm. Uh, and even how that played out was crazy. My wife, uh, was a youth minister at our church and was really eager to, to go uh, to seminary and was exploring different ways. But her passion was she wanted to go to Wycliffe Hall at Oxford University. And uh, it's an evangelical Anglican seminary. And, uh, and I was like, sweetie, we're not moving. Like, that ain't happening. And I got, I got, uh, uh, put on a, a project uh, in out of our London office. And uh, for six weeks and two weeks in, they came and said, uh, would you like to stay? And, um, <laughs> you know, I called my wife and said, hey, we need to pray about it. And she said, no, we don't need to pray about it. <laughs> happy wife, happy life, right? <laughs> but, you know, the, the story again, God's, God's grace and, and blessing. Um, so Julie comes over for a visit during that six week period and with, and says, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go up to Wycliffe on this third on Friday, and then we'll hang out and I'll come back. And my mom had, had flown over too. And so they make plans to go up, uh, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, and bo lo and behold, Friday is the uh, prospective student day hmm. at Wycliffe hall. <laughs> and so it was just incredible how it worked um, we lived in, in London and I was, I couldn't commute and they said, well, Oxford never grants waivers, uh, for people to commute. So you guys, I don't know how you're going to work this, but you're welcome to submit a waiver. They just won't accept it. We submitted a waiver. They granted it. It was just, you know, the Lord really continued to open doors. And so she got uh, to do one of her life dreams of, of getting a, a theology degree at, at uh, Oxford. 
So that was really cool. And, um, but, but things really changed for us when we moved home. Um, we moved home to Houston uh, in 2011, uh, and I was still practicing and uh, law. I was a partner now at my law firm, um, Vincent and Elkins. And, uh, but we had read this book, The Hole in Our Gospel. And um, I don't know if you know that book, um, yeah. but um, talking about, you know, really investing in your faith and having your, your actions, you know, meet. Um, we had been really involved. We, in, in London, we were blessed to live in a very affluent area in Chelsea, and we loved our church, but we really weren't surrounded by people who weren't affluent. And, but we felt really called to, to minister to low income, the low income community in Houston and got involved with a few Christian ministries, uh, Agape Development uh, and the Forge for Families, both in, in kind of that third ward area. And they had a, a philosophy about incarnational you know, ministry, where you actually, what Jesus did is he, he, moved, he came to earth where the people were. Right. And, he, and we felt like we were being called to move uh, to the third ward. And so we moved into uh, the inner city, a couple blocks from Texas Southern uh, University and Gates High School, where our players were, and um, really felt like that, you know, that was our opportunity to get a lot more touches with the players hmm. and to understand the community better. Um, and so we did that, and uh, it, that was a, an unbelievably special season in our life. We were there uh, for five years. Um, we had felt called to adoption, too, um, and completely separate and distinct. We felt called to adopt transracially. Um, so we had adopted African-American kids. And uh, wow. It just really worked that they were in a community where the people looked more like them than they did their parents. And uh, um, so it was really great. And um, ultimately what happened, uh, at least spiritually, is we, we restarted the, the AAU program called His Hoops. Um, and His Hoops was um, out of the forge for families, but it was a um, a program where the, the young, young guys would come to the ministry. The ministry had a gym, actually two gyms, an educational facility, um, and also a dining area. And they would come uh, and do uh, online learning. Um, and we would do uh, reading comprehension and math with them. And, uh, and then they would eat. The Houston Food Bank provided meals. Uh, we would do a devotional and then we would do individual workouts or team practice. And um, it was incredible to, and that was four days a week. And then we would play tournaments on the weekends, usually about three weekends a month. Hmm. And you just spent so much time with the guys and you could just see the fruit. It was just, the fruit was so rapid. Um, and that was really neat. And that's where I think my, I think God really started to speak. Griff Aldrich is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, Longwood men's basketball coach. A couple of questions I want to ask you that kind of will bounce to different places because 2016 was a pivotal year for you to open up more doors for you to go back into coaching in a, in a, in a higher level, in a college level. And I want to tell that story, but you mentioned adoption and I did have it down in my notes. I did want to ask you about that and three adopted children, right? All of your children are adopted. Is that correct? Right. Yes. So there's a heart there behind adoption. Can you just kind of go into what, where you think that, what that came from that heart to go and adopt and to adopt, like you said, three kids who didn't look like you. Yeah. Well, I think, um, well, we, you know, we did have fertility issues and we were going through fertility um, treatments and, and things like that or, or trying to figure out what was happening in, in that regard. Sure. Um, but my wife and I, even while we were doing that, said adoption 
shouldn't be as a result of either one, at least for us. Um, I don't want to speak on on anyone else, but we felt like we were really, you know, that was something that we were very interested in. And um, and so we we started to explore that. Um, we actually started to explore it in London. And I said, and I don't, I can't explain this, Jason, but I have always had a heart. Um, I shouldn't say always. Um, I didn't grow up around African Americans. I went to a private school, yeah. um, pretty homogenous community churches. Um, but my heart has been to invest in particularly young African American men. And, uh, and, um, you know, when we talked about adoption, I said, you know, that's what I feel like we're called to, to do. And the question kind of came, well, isn't that going to be hard? And I said, yeah, it, it probably will be. Um, but, um, I want our kids to know that they were chosen, that they're not a replacement, but that they're, they're chosen yeah. and that we chose them. And, um, we got great advice from, um, and counsel from, some other uh, uh, friends, actually, uh, um, uh, I don't know if you uh, know Marvin Olasky, who used to be of, of World Magazine, hmm. um, but, uh, you know, the Olaskis had, had adopted, and they said one of the, if they could do it over again, they said they would make sure that they adopted multiple, and they said, you know, we had a white family and then a transracial son, and he probably always felt like the outsider and yeah. it would have been better for him to have a buddy where uh or a, a comrade where they could team up on the parents and sure, uh sure. and so we we uh we had we kind of went into adoption thinking that we would we would you know regardless if biological children were were a part of god's plan for us we would have multiple and uh that's been the the richest. My wife's the best, um, and she's the biggest blessing. Uh, but behind her, my three kids are, you know, they're the best. How many? You say you have three kids, all boys. Uh, two two boys and a girl. Ten. Okay. One about to be eleven. One who just turned ten, and a seven year old. Wow. So this is an interesting season of life as they get ready for the middle school grade and and start to grow and become, you know. A little bit more mature i'll say i don't know it feels like i have a teenager it feels like sometimes they get a little less mature before they get to the maturity level that you're hoping that they get yeah. to maybe when you get them in college right Griff? <laughs> that's right that's right well they're they're and it's so crazy you know i i actually think having these kids has really helped me as a coach because you start to realize you you have to parent differently yeah. and i think you have to coach differently and the kids differently and so that's been a that's been a neat experience so let's go to 2016 uh god opened up an incredible door there for you to make a coaching uh decision um and that it, it kind of took it from a side hustle to a to a bigger deal and then everything starts to kind of you probably look back and you say okay god i see what you were doing here over these next four or five years take me to 2016 and tell everybody what happened yeah, I think I got to go to 2015. I'm, I'm 25th, sorry, I know I'm long better. winded. Uh, no, that's okay. But, um, you know, 2015, I was I had now moved into finance, uh, energy finance, and I was uh, working at a private equity firm. Um, and I'd left practicing law, but I was I was heavily involved in his hoops, the AAU program, right. and I loved my job. And it was challenging times in the energy markets, um, but at the same time, it was fun. Um, but I was waking up every morning thinking about the guys, my players, and thinking about what tournaments and how they were doing and were they going to make it to, to workouts today or, you know, what what challenge was, was around the corner. Um, and... Um, it increasingly became a bigger part of, of what our family was doing. And um, 
I went to my wife and I said, you know, I'm thinking about going to my boss and saying, can I do a hybrid role? I like, I think, you know, coaching may be something God's calling me to do. And this, is, this wasn't a month or two, this had been going on for, you know, about 12 to 18 months. And Griff, and, you're what, about 40, maybe at this time? Uh, I was 2016. Um, what is that six years ago? So, yeah, it's about 41. Yeah. So and this is kind of half time of life, as I like to tell people, life. right? <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's exactly right. And I actually read, read a book called 4040 Vision. Um, and uh, um, I think the, the founder of Hope International, uh, Peter, I forget his last name, uh, was one of the co-authors. Hmm. But I think in a lot of different ways, God was hitting me on from a faith perspective. And I was really growing in that area. And I really think that the big part is too, um, the allure of climbing and the allure of, uh, of status and things it, and I can't explain it. It was becoming less and less attractive. And, and I don't want to say attractive. It was less of a driver maybe. And, um, that, that whole life, um, and I'm not, we're, we were a part of a country club or, and still are, um, but it just wasn't as much of a draw maybe as it had been. Sure. And, um, I really felt like my faith was becoming more prominent and, and I had been a committed Christian. I mean, we were in Bible studies. I mean, that I had been walking with the Lord now for 20 years um, but it was, it was now transforming from just really into how I identify myself. And about November of 2015, it really started to hit me that if really my identity is in Christ, it doesn't matter what I do or how much I make, or like, you're really freed up to do what you feel like God's calling you to do. Mm. And I'm feeling this claw more and more to invest in young men and through basketball. And I would flat out come alive on the practice floor. Sure. Um, and, um, and so I, I initially thought it would be a hybrid and my wife kind of said, well, don't you love college? And uh, I said, yeah, but I can't, like, you can't, like, that ship has passed. And I also had in the back of my mind that that issue at William & Mary with Shaver, like, if God wanted me to be a college coach, that would have happened. Like, right, you would have opened up a door. <laughs> he would have done it. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I started talking to some of my friends um, who were still coaching, Ryan Odom being one of them, and he encouraged me. Um I talked to a guy who'd gotten out of the business, uh, who's, who's now a great friend, um, had been a head coach at the division two level and was now working at a bank. And I said, I'm going to get some wisdom from Chad Warner to say, no, you, you're just coach your AAU. Like yeah. college coaching is nuts. And I kind of told him what I was thinking. And he, he let me finish and goes, well, I said, well, what do you think? He goes, well, I've been trying to get back into coaching for a week after I, I got out. And so, <laughs> you know, fast forward a couple of months, my buddy, Ryan Odom got a, got the job at UMBC. And, um, you know, he, he said, um, Griff, you could really help me in essence, be my chief of staff and help me build the program, use your corporate skills, uh, to help us build a program and you can, do the basketball and uh, kind of get up caught up to speed on college basketball, but still invest in guys. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so, um, you know, that's what we, that's what we did. So you walked away from being a lawyer and went to UMBC. Well, I was in You're private lawyer, equity, I guess. <laughs> well, I was a private equity at that point, but yeah, I walked away from, from that at that point. And uh you know, it was confusing for a lot of people. And, sure. but, you know, Jason, at that point, I, you know, people say, oh man, you sacrificed. 
but like when God is calling you, like it, it, it was a soul decision. It wasn't in like, we, that's what we were supposed to do. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, we had some family members. I had one who said, Hey, your responsibility is to take care of your family. And I said, that's right. But my responsibility first and foremost is to follow God's call. And if he's calling me to that, then that's what I need to do. And fortunately, my, our family both on both sides are, are full of committed believers. Um, and so we've gotten a lot of support, um, even when we kind of jumped off the cliff, so to speak. Well, you don't know a lot about my story and I'll share it when we're off the air a little bit, but I can relate completely, even coming to sports spectrum and leaving ESPN, you and I have, I think a lot in common in terms of taking that leap, taking that step and following God's call on your life. What's, what's fascinating to me is you go to UMBC and people, when they hear that it's university of Maryland, Baltimore County, why does that name sound familiar? Well, you remember in 2018, uh, Virginia was the number one seed and they're facing the 16 seed UMBC and you guys win. You pull off uh, a miracle in many ways in college basketball by becoming the first and still only 16 seed to beat a one seed. I really just want to hear about that experience from your perspective as I know you were an assistant coach or, you know, helping the team out at that point, but it's still an amazing experience to be a part of when you're talking about history here in the game of basketball. What was that like? Yeah, it, it was, it was, again, I keep using the words to real, but it, it was, um, it, it was, it was, it was, it was really surreal in that, you know, before the game, we, I think we felt like we um, had a good matchup. Um, like if you're going to have to play a number one seed, um, we felt like uh, the way that we, the way that we played was probably the hardest thing for Virginia to, to try to defend. Um, they, they didn't play well against, you know, or the teams that they struggled the most against um, were the teams that kind of played the same style that we did, which was more kind of up-tempo um, and could pressure a little bit more on the defensive end. Um, now, I think they had only lost one game at that point, so we weren't, <laughs> we weren't, we weren't <laughs> expecting uh, them to, to struggle. And, you know, they suffered the injury with DeAndre Hunter, which I think people forget about um, a lot. Sure. Um, but we thought we had a good game plan. And then we had a really seasoned, confident group of guys um, who had played against Arizona when Arizona was number one. We were up playing really badly against Maryland and we're up seven at halftime, uh, almost beat SMU when they were a top 25 team. So we had some guys who really believed in, in, in the team and themselves. And I think when we were able to kind of hang with them for a while, our confidence just continued to grow and to grow and to grow. And then the beautiful thing about basketball is, you know, unlike football and, and, you know, certainly some other team sports, you know, it's probably like pitching. If, if you've got a great pitcher, you might be able to shut the other team down. Um, of course. And that, and that night, Jarris Lyles just had an incredible night and it just kind of snowballed. And then everybody started making shots and our confidence swooned. Um, and I have no idea what happened in, on their side of the, 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 the court, but my guess is they probably started to get a little tighter. Um, and um, I still remember with about eight minutes left, I think we were up, you know, 16. And I thought, I don't think they can score fast enough to get back in with just the way they play. And, uh, and so it was, it was really an, an unbelievable experience. Yeah. And it was a great experience. I had coach Bennett on, Tony Bennett uh, from Virginia, probably six months, maybe five months after they had lost to you guys. And it was also right before they started the next season when, of course, they went on and won the national championship. And it was a really great God story for him and for his program as well. And he handled that loss and said, you know what? Yeah, it stinks. It's embarrassing, if you will, for a number one seed. But there's so many lessons 
that we're going to take away from this. And obviously they went on. So you, you don't ever want to be that team. But if you want to say, okay, I'll be that team if you want to trade in for a national championship the next year and have all the lessons that those kids who went through that experience will have. And the same on your end from a different a different side of it. There's so many experiences and lessons from that that you'll be able to take with you. Four days later, was it was it that quickly, four days later, that this opportunity for you to come to Longwood happened? And that must have been out of, I wouldn't say out of nowhere, but a, probably a little bit out of nowhere because you were just a couple of years removed from not being in coaching at all. And suddenly a division one program is saying, Hey Griff, we want to have you come along here and be our head coach. Well, and there's really a God story behind this. You know, I think people hear the story of my journey and it's really easy to go from, well, he went from private equity to beating Virginia at UMBC to, you know, going to the NCAA tournament at Longwood and you know, your faith journey is, as I sure, I'm sure you know, too, it, it's not always just peaks, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot, a of, lot valleys. of valleys. <laughs> and, you know, we made the decision to go to UMBC. But personally, for me, it was really hard. Uh, when I got there, um, you know, I was doing receipts, I had been the CFO of a private equity firm. Uh, with two secretaries assigned to me. And now I was filling out receipt forms and booking buses. And uh, from an ego perspective, you know, I loved the basketball. I hated doing flight arrangements. Sure. And, um, and uh, it was very humbling. Um, and uh, that was really hard. And uh, that was a hard period. Um, and I know my wife still loves to tell this story that, you know, the first year it was okay, but I wasn't even an assistant coach. I was the director of operations. So I say you, really, you weren't even a coach when you first started I wasn't even a coach. I yeah. was doing gear and that type of stuff and making sure that there's water in the locker room. Um, <laughs> And now Ryan was extremely gracious and I was able to be very involved. Uh, but a lot of my mundane tasks were, were humbling. Um, and that second year I was, I, I had had it. I was like, God, what are like, this is miserable. Like I love the basketball, but like, God, get me out of this. Yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah. yeah what am what like? please, you didn't bring me out here to the desert just to keep doing receipts. And, um, and I, and God in his goodness and graciousness, um, I get a uh, phone call from one of the elderly gentlemen in uh, our church, uh, Preston Athey, he'll be mad that I used his name. <laughs> um, but he called me and uh, Preston had been a portfolio manager at T. Rowe Price and had been really successful. And uh, he said, Griff, um, I wanted to come see what you, see what you do at work. And, uh, and so I want to come watch a practice and then can we meet for 30 minutes afterwards? And I said, sure. And so he came and he watched and, you know, he of course knew my story and, um, he anyway, I kind of unloaded to him um, a little bit, just my frustrations and I've made this jump, but I feel stagnant. And he relayed to me a story about a similar experience when he was a younger uh, finance associate at T. Rowe Price and felt like I'm never going to get an opportunity. And he, he told me, he went to his boss and said, you know, all of the portfolios have young managers who are going to be there for 10 years. And he got some good counsel that the only constant in life is change <laughs> and that God is going to do what God's going to do. And you just need to trust that and prepare. And he told me how he did that and encouraged me to do the same thing in my role. And, you know, his story is within six months, three of the portfolio managers had moved on. He got bumped up because of his preparation and then went on to a knockout career. And 
so I took his counsel and uh, six weeks later, I get a call from Longwood mm -hmm. and I had been preparing and now, you know, I'd been preparing for two years, but I had been intensely preparing for that six weeks of, okay, what, what would I be doing? And I just thought it was God's sweetness knowing that I was challenged in that period. And he sent, he sent somebody and uh, Preston and I still talk on a monthly basis and he mentors me and counsels me. Um, but, um, you know, it was a really hard season and, um, but then, you know, then God, you know, then God sent the rain and uh, it was great. Yeah, it's 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 being faithful in the little, you know, just as much as you be faithful with the big, right? And it's stewarding, you know, I call it blooming where you're planted. Every moment, every little area of your life, if you're stewarding that properly, if you're being faithful in that in that area that you're in properly, uh, you know, let then let God do what God can do and see where He takes you. He took you to Longwood, and it's such a great story, Griff Aldrich. Um, so my last question here as we wind down, because there's so much more we could spend, but I want to be mindful of both of our times here. Yeah. Um, tell me about coaching as a platform to live out your faith. You've clearly talked a lot about your faith, We've talked a lot about the opportunities, but now looking at a place like Longwood, where you're the head coach, and now eyeballs are on you, especially when you have a lot of success and you go to the NCAA tournament, what does that look like as a platform for you to be a good ambassador for Christ? It's a great question. And Jason, it's something I'm still trying to figure out. Um, you know, both as a, you know, as a head coach and a member of my community, um, as well as, you know, how do I, how do I deal with, with our players in that regard? Um, and it's something that um, I think is evolving. For me, um, you know, I am at a public university, so you know we have to to be mindful of that. Sure. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I do believe. You know, somebody asked me about how does my faith inform my coaching, and it's you know, it's like when politicians say my faith is separate, and I don't understand that. My faith informs everything I do. Um, it's, it's the core of who I am. And, um, and so it's the lens at which, through which I, I look at every situation I'm sinful and I screw it up, you know, sure. yeah. at an elite level. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's something where, um, I don't want to shy away, uh, especially the journey that, that we've had, because I, it's providential. You know, I, I didn't, I never dreamed this was never, this wasn't my plan. Yeah. You can't um, help but tell people yeah. about how great God is right. When you think about your story. Yeah. And when people ask, I, I, I felt like God wanted me to do it and to, to coach. And I, I never thought we would be here. And so uh, it's really core to, to our journey uh, it's core to our family. Um, and, um, you know, I just hope I, I, I don't screw it up, uh, through my sinfulness, but, um, but yeah, it's good stuff there. He is Griff Aldrich. Thanks so much, Griff. I uh, really appreciate you. I like that. I called you coach and you were like, Nope, call me Griff. I said, you got it. I will call you by your name because you're not my coach. Right. Although I think that's a common thing from the broadcasting world or the media world is to call any coach coach. Uh, but I appreciate you, Griff Aldrich. Thanks for being yeah. here. Uh, continued success with Longwood and all the best to you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.